And now let's have a little breakout session with our analysts. Phil Helm, what do we need to know? Hey, yeah, thank you, Brendan. So, Erno, uh, let's first talk a little bit about strategy hybridization. So, could you explain to us a bit what do we actually mean by, by this? Yeah, of course. So, about the strategy hybridization. So, what it's a basically a trend that we are seeing currently in the market, in the strategy genre, and especially if we are looking at the Forex strategy games. So, by Forex, we of course mean the games that are these March battle games, you know, building your bases, like training your units and, and uh, sending troops to fight and conquering the world map yeah, and, and stuff. Worlds, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so what what are we seeing in there is this hybridization uh, trend. Uh, so we are seeing these type of games actually taking quite a lot of elements from other type of genres. So for example, recently from a casual genres. Okay, so uh, uh, what kind of, for example, examples uh, of this strategy hybridization are we seeing right now other than other than what you mentioned? Like how, how did this whole thing start? Yeah, yeah. So of course, like uh, these kind of things have been happening for a while already. So if we are thinking about years back, uh, yeah. these kind of like games like Lords Mobile. Uh, of course, they were uh, taking elements from RPG games and having these kind of like characters you collect. Uh, you have the RPG layer you're battle battling in uh, on top of the actual uh, deep forex uh, mechanics and forex layer. Then. Uh, games like, for example, Rise of Kingdoms is pushing this same same stuff. You you have your ca uh, characters that you're collecting and developing in a kind of like a RPG manner. Then there are games from a couple of years ago, like uh, Star Trek Timelines, uh, for example, which is the game uh, from Scopely Forex game, but it is more kind of like a character-based focus. So it's not about training units and and and, and stuff like that, which is the, like the usual Forex uh, approach, but it's actually more leaning towards on uh, developing characters and stuff like that. Yeah, so I guess there's been loads of this kind of character RPG utilization. In the yeah, I would say the RPG uh, character utilization and these kind of layers, it's nothing new to be honest mm, yeah. uh, in the market. But now the trend is, I would say, it's getting wider and, and there are more and more kind of like influences from uh, all kind of different type of games as well uh, outside the kind of like uh, the uh, RPG uh, elements. So as an example, uh, if we look at the top crossing charts in the US as, a, uh, as an example. Uh, w the latest big hits, uh, almost all of them are taking some kind of elements from other genres and kind of like trying to diversify the product uh, and diversify themselves from the market by doing this kind of like a in taking influences from other genres. So games like, for example, Top War, uh, yeah. one of the recent success, I think it's like Top Crossing 50 game at least. Yeah, uh, in yeah the last US. time I checked, it was, I think it was in top, top Crossing 33 position. You, yeah, so exactly. Extremely and well. and it's, it's been scaling really, really heavily mm. during the past year, for example. And it's a game that uses a merge mechanic uh, on top of the kind of like the uh, basic forex strategy. Yeah, from the casual stuff. side. Yeah, yeah which mm. is also trending in the casual, the merge mechanics and stuff yeah. like that. Then another really good example or uh, 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 good examples are, for example, Age of Jets. It's a str uh, forex strategy game that has this tower defense mode. Then we have games, uh, they're probably the... Uh, the latest, uh, this kind of a game, is a game called Puzzles and Survival, which is a Forex game, but they actually have this match tree element on top of the uh, yeah. Forex strategy game. So you have this a bit like puzzle RPG or like Empires and Puzzle type of gameplay on top of the deep Forex, uh, Forex gameplay and so on. So we are seeing these kind of games uh, that are widening their offering and then, of course, naturally trying to find newer audiences, wider audiences uh, by on, on a product side, uh, by uh, innovating on, the, on, on these type of things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, why do you think this kind of strategy hybridization is happening then? Why, why are these new games bringing elements from the casual, from the RPG side? And what, what is the thing that is actually driving this? Yeah, well, of course, innovation and trying to differentiate your product from the market, it's kind of natural. Yeah. Uh, and if we look at the Forex, uh, Forex market, it's been uh, quite stagnant for a while already. And, and a lot of the games feel almost a little bit kind of like a carbon cut copies mm. or with the different themes and stuff like that. But the underlying mechanics are really, really similar. But uh, of course, uh, this uh, one of the main reasons is to differentiate from the market. Bring, try something new, try something uh, exciting. 
But then uh, one of the big kind of like an industry, revol- maybe or we don't necessarily yet know how, how it's going to affect, but most likely kind of like a the thing that uh, changes the market is the idea of depreciation and with the ad targeting. So if we're thinking about this type of games, uh, they are usually a kind of like a niche, niche uh, audience game. So... So games with kind of like a smaller audiences, but they are quite like a really um, uh, highly paying uh, uh, or like a really high revenue per download, re- yeah. really high revenue per installs uh, type of games. And those whole games monetization model is based on that and whale monetization and stuff like that. So if we're thinking about the upcoming idea of depreciation and if we are thinking about the like the thing that we kind of target those, uh, our niche audience anymore as effectively anymore. So what's going to happen to the product side? So I would say it's kind of like a natural evolvement that we are bringing these kind of different elements and try to widen our audience Uh, trying to find new audiences to this genre without sacrificing the depth of the forex uh, forex uh, games. So these games like Top War, yeah. very casual, uh, kind of like a merge mechanic that appeals to different audiences, and then of course the cartoonist art style that's mm-hmm. appealing exactly. to different different audiences, and then then you can use that in in your UA campaigns and stuff like that. Yeah, I guess one of the one of the like the big things. Uh, be, uh, behind the success of Top War and, for example, the Puzzles and Survival, is, uh, I guess, definitely the appealing towards more different audiences and not relying too much on that having high revenue per download when you have loads of loads of players coming from all the different genres. Yeah, well, at, at least finding new new new, yeah. new audiences uh, yeah. f- for sure. So that's 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 like a common commonality in the recent top uh, games in that specific subgenre for sure. Yeah. Okay. Hey, we still have some time, so let's hop on the dif- little bit different kind of subject. Then. So, everyone's f- favorite feature, battle bus plan, <laughs> of course. So uh, it feels almost like it's a feature that ever since it's been it's been here for a while already. Yeah. <clears throat> But ever since it's it, it, it sort of started appearing games, it just it's a feature that just keeps and keeps gaining popularity, and there doesn't seem to be any end. So. Uh, do you have any insights on uh, how popular is it is the feature actually? Yeah, so of course, like in Game Refiner, we are yeah. that's what we do. We track feature, we track feature data, and provide that to our clients. So, so still, uh, even after years, uh, the the feature has been around with battle passes. It's still probably the the top trending feature, the one feature that is getting the more pop, mo, most uh, kind of like a popular. And if you look at our statistics, so. I just looked yesterday actually about our our our, our data, and it just crossed the 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 line of uh, being in top uh, top 50 percent of the top crossing 100 games in the U.S. So if you look at the top crossing 100, it's over half of those games already have a battle pass, no matter what what's the genre, no matter what what type of game we are talking about. Yeah, and, I get, yeah. and if you if we look at the statistics uh, from kind of like one year ago, so 12 months ago, the number was only 29, so 29 percent. So we have seen still uh, big increases uh, yeah. in this feature. Yeah, I guess if you have that kind of numbers over over half of the of the games in the top 100 has the battle pass, it has to mean that it's appearing all loads of different kind of genres. So why do you think the, the, the feature actually fits in 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 loads of different kind of games, different kind of audiences? Then, yeah, uh, well, of course, uh, without going too deep on uh, implementation side on different genres, and of course, different genres and different type of game need different implementations, need different type of things that they are offering, and so on. But I would say first. And foremost, uh, it's a progression and engagement feature. So it, yeah. it gives another layer of progression. It's an engaging feature that players uh, can uh, progress in, gives them a concrete uh, sense of progression and things to work toward, uh, work towards, and giving this kind of like a rewards reg- regularly and so on. Then. Secondly, as we of course see where it started, the uh, cosmetic economy. So it doesn't necessarily have to be directly linked to the core gameplay. Then, of course, being a monetization feature, having the direct monetization uh, with the premium layers and stuff like that. And then, of course, I would say also really importantly, the indirect monetization through the engagement. So. Uh, players that are coming back because they are want to kind of like a progress in their battle pass and being this kind of like engagement progression feature, and then it kind of goes back towards other monetization things, for example. 
And uh, also, I would say it's it's a kind of like a feature uh, that often is uh, kind of appealing for the lower ARPU players or or the kind of like even non-payers. So it feels a feature that you you know you you know what you're getting, and you have the kind of like a fear of missing out when you have already progressed in the free mm. layer, and yeah. you feel that okay. Uh, let's say I, I have already kind of like unlocked this stuff, so why why wouldn't I kind of like uh, uh, pay the pre premium price and, uh, and get those uh, all the all the best rewards and stuff like that? And usually it's kind of like a low low price point uh, anyway, and that that's uh, why it's appealing to that kind of audiences. And then uh, of course of course uh, depending on the implementation, but something that we have seen, for example, in casual games, for example, what Playrix is doing, they have doubled down on. Battle passes on all all of their games and stuff like that. They are offering these like a collectible rewards and stuff like that on the battle pass. And if we're thinking about monetization motivations for for players, so there might be a big audience, let's say in match free game, that necessarily don't want to, yeah. for example, pay for the boosters. They feel it's cheating, for example. And what Garden Escapes is doing with the battle pass, they're offering these collectible areas and stuff like that you can get permanently for your gardening. And it taps into a little bit of a different motivation and it can be helpful for converting those players, as an example. Yeah, yeah, definitely a feature that appeals to, as you, as you mentioned, different kind of motivations. And I'd say, for sure, really easy thing to purchase, especially for a player that n does not necessarily usually purchase, for example, the boosters that you mentioned. Yep. Uh, uh, the battle passes have usually been sort of quite, quite similar approach, but do you have any like interesting examples, for example, that uh, has has any games done it? Have you seen any games doing it? Have more more unique uh, ways to bring in battle pass plan, or is it all always the same? Yeah, of course uh, there are differences uh, and then innovation on that that side as well. But of course most of the battle pass implementations they are quite similar task based progression mm. and stuff like that. But there are of course uh, interesting ways that we have seen the feature in uh, kind of like innovated with. So to give a couple of examples was for example the the one I was talking about earlier, the Gardenscapes battle pass. They have this kind of like a Leaning more towards like a subscription model, giving yeah. kind of like a perks and stuff like that. So uh, for the duration of season, so you kind of like a convert earlier uh, for the battle pass, not 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 after kind of like a in the very last day when you have already earned what uh, what what uh, what what you can get from there and stuff like that. And also another kind of like interesting uh, factor with Garden Escape battle pass is that they have now been giving like this kind of like a premium. Uh, layer trial, so mm. you get the kind of like a four, five first uh, uh, tiers of battle pass for free, and then, then it cuts off just before the like the first collectible item, the big uh, kind of like an incentivator for the conversion and and, yeah. and so on. So uh, those are a couple a couple examples. Then, for example, strategy games, we have seen these like three layered mm. battle passes with a free layer, premium layer, and then kind of like a double premium layer and stuff like that. How about you? Yeah, I've actually seen a couple interesting as well. But for example, and in the top four, as you as as we talked about earlier, they're not they're also bring uh, bringing unique way in, in their own uh, battle pass plan. So normally in the battle pass plan, you, you progress yourself. It's it, it, all the progression is done by yourself. But that's the for example, the game itself is really guild based. Uh, they have their battle pass plan as a sort of the co op mode so basically the guild members are uh, uh, doing tasks together and and progressing cooperatively in, in the in the tasks whether the guild members have purchased or not they can all participate and all of course the the, the guys who do not purchase the purchase the premium tier they get the free rewards and of course if you have purchased you get the you get the yeah. paid rewards as 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 in normal battle pass but hey uh, Erno, I think we are running out of time here. Uh, it's as always. It's been really nice <laughs> chatting with you. Uh, let's go back to Brendan. Thank you, Brendan, and uh, thank you, Nathaniel, for the uh, excellent presentation on the on what's going on in the world of monetization. Um, so let's go into the topic of uh, live ops, and in more specific terms, let's talk about seasonal um, events. So we as analysts, of course, we're following the, the market uh, very closely and we're playing a lot of games, seeing a lot of stuff uh, in relation to, to these seasonal events. So Wilhelm, what is it that we are currently seeing in the, in the market in terms of seasonal events? Yeah, hey, that's a great question. Uh, so 
Nowadays, when we look at, for example, the top crossing 100 games, they have, they are nowadays they are extremely popular. So about 90% of top crossing 100 games use some kind of or have used some kind of seasonal events. Uh, and when we look at more closely how they are, how, how those top crossing games are actually utilizing them, we can see that almost that many of the many of the top crossing games they actually use almost all of the all of the bigger seasonal events. For example, Christmas, uh, New Year, uh, Halloween. Those are the one of the biggest biggest events. Uh, but but, uh, but also. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <true>. Nice change. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, but also uh, getting popular each year are the smaller events as well. So Oktoberfest and Midsummer, for example, uh, are getting more and more popular each each year. Uh, but when we look at the event structure, then in the top crossing games, uh, th those basically depending on the event, they vary all the way from th these UI changes, for example, Christmas theme and, and uh, lim limited time offers to huge fully fledged events with uh, e like event tax tasks currencies uh, you have limited time co uh, content such as for example special event levels uh, and and most importantly uh, special rewards for example christmas themed uh, costumes and so on and of course of course you have the gotchas which is in some games uh, super important you have the limited time event gotchas and so on uh, there's also uh, seems to be a bit of a trend as well that uh, some games are for, like, for using sort of to help in the live ops. They're using this sort of kind of reskinning the past events. So, for example, you have you had you had they have this event going on uh, in the game for a past year, and they have they have the Christmas event, but it's basically with the similar mechanics as the past events. Of course, it's quite good because the players are obviously familiar with that mechanic as well. And this is also uh, I'd, I'd say one of the good reasons to, why they are doing this is because oh, there's of course limitations with the live ops, and this makes it possible to utilize uh, most, if not even all, of the seasonal events happening during the year. Willem, I totally uh, agree with you. I think it's just smart to be able to sort of uh, rotate uh, live, op live ops content that uh, that is possible to be sort of looped uh, in the in the game and use it as efficiently uh, as possible. Yeah. But Willem, can you give us any sort of uh, like more even more specific, interesting uh, examples of the seasonal events that you have personally witnessed in in the games that you play. Yeah, yeah. For example, one game, uh, Sims Mobile, is actually a really good example of this. So what they what they used to do is that they had this cooking show event, which basically uh, it happened many times a year. For example, it was I think they have that Christmas cooking show event and so on. So rolling this same similar event in in many of the seasonal events. But what they have been adding on top of that is bringing new mechanical new mechanics to events each year um, so to keep the keep the mechanics completely fresh uh, for the players and right now they have for example the cooking show they are still utilizing the cooking show mechanics but they are also mix and matching different kind of events for example uh, during uh, end of last year they added this uh, treasure hunt event and of course in, in the, with the easter uh, smaller events as easter they have sort of for example uh, smaller tasks and simpler way, ways to introduce them like that uh, yeah, I think it goes really well the the egg hunt thing with the, yeah, with the Easter yeah, Easter exactly, event. Exactly, exactly. Uh, Kalle, you're you're like a pretty much a true master of 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 knowledge in the Asian markets, especially in China. So, is there any kind of seasonal events that we are not so familiar in the in the Western markets that we are not seeing? Yeah, so I'm gonna put this very shortly. Yep. So all you need to remember is. Five five seven seven and eleven eleven. So five five is the Dragon Boat uh, Festival uh, on fifth of May. Uh, seven seven is the CC, which is the uh, uh, the sort of Valentine's Day in in, in China in in July. And then eleven eleven is of obviously the Singles Day. So especially the eleven eleven, I encourage all the game developers who are <laughs> uh, operating live ops in, in in China to use that for uh, promotions, discounts, bundle offers, and, and and stuff like that. Sounds good. Yeah, um, so I think that uh, feels our time for the uh, seasonal event talk. So um, I'm throwing this back to Brendan. Take it away. Yeah, I think it's high time to talk about uh, one of the 
most successful launches, uh, mobile game launches of uh, last year. So uh, and most talked. And most <laughs> talked. So <laughs> even we are talking about it right now. Genshin Impact, obviously. Uh, 40 million play people play it uh, at the moment. Um, uh, Erno, can you give us a brief intro to what Genshin Impact really is and what is it that makes it so special? Yeah, well, if we start by look, taking a little bit of a look, kind of like, especially I'm coming from the Western uh, like a part of, of the market and looking at the Western view. So if you look at the uh, mobile game market, on especially on the action RPG genre, if we look at the mobile games that have been there uh, like previously, they have been quite meta heavy. So the the main beef why those games are played is because of like enjoying the progression uh, systems that the game have and so on and so on. And often the core gameplay, it's not has been the kind of like the the main kind of like um, focus on or it's been even more addressed in the Asian markets, especially exactly. for example in China. Yeah. Exactly. So if you if you're looking at just the differentiation factors those are uh, uh, kind of like a couple of things that i would point out like in a quick manner with the genshin impact it's the huge production value and focus on the core gameplay how it feels and then of course being an open world single player rpg for a mobile we haven't seen those uh, too much on the market so what i would say that in a way genshin is kind of like a best of both worlds from from console market and the mobile game market so it's it's actually a, a mobile game that has core gameplay that can be kind of like uh, compared uh, um, to con to console title premium AAA console titles, especially uh, in the action RPG. We haven't seen that kind of uh, things uh, too much, but. It's a free-to-play game. It has this kind of like a meta progression systems that we have seen on the mobile game market quite a bit. So I would say it's kind of like a best of both worlds. So from from having the console kind of like a core gameplay and then the mobile game uh, meta on top of that. And then of course uh, third factor, the big big thing is uh, the cross cross platform play, and and that's definitely something that's most likely a trend uh, in in the upcoming years. And and it's really interesting to see where the market goes uh, in terms of that. So for ex as an example, especially, of course, not a single company has the resources like Miojo had and huge risk with the massive budget and, and so on. But for example, last I think it was last week, Zynga announced that they are making their Star Wars Hunters game with a game like a Star Wars IP game that is going to be launched on, Sw on Nintendo Switch and also on mobile. So it's going to be really interesting to see kind of like a, what kind of a game that is for example, and is this something that especially the big companies are looking forward to and, and uh, kind of like a taking um, inspiration with the, uh, with the success of Genshin Impact? It's really interesting that you mentioned that, that because just uh, like, uh, I, don't, I think it was a couple of days ago or something like that, the, the president of uh, Mihojo uh, actually said that his ultimate goal is to create a virtual world in which one billion people worldwide are willing to live by 2030. And he also plans to release a new product every three to four years on his way to achieving uh, that goal, with Genshin Impact being, being the sort of first prototype for, for, for this one billion person MMO. So I guess my question uh, is, is this, that do, what do you think does Mihojo, Mihojo, with this strategy, does it have what it takes to sort of uh, pave the way for more ARPGs and MMO, MMORPGs to find success in the Western market? Uh, just like personally, I, I hope so, uh, because I, I like the game a, a lot and, and, and so on. And uh, if we're talking about Genshin and everybody's talking about, like like, like I said before, the, the risk, the huge budget that they took, because that's something a bit new into the market. And... Uh, pouring in those hundreds millions of dollars into game. So that kind of like a comment tells us that uh, at least they are not kind of like a backing down. They have the sure. very, very ambitious kind of like ideas on where to go next, what kind of a, how to build their games, even more ambitious than Genshin Impact was. So, so really, really interesting uh, trend to follow in the, in the market. For sure, yeah. All right, that's it for Genshin.